you, worship team, for leading us today. You know, as I was uh, hearing all those worship songs, I was thinking about how maybe I picked the wrong passage today, because this evening, when I'm at the camp, my first uh, message is going to be focused on Jesus calming the storm. And I'm like, can we bring all those songs along to camp to sing um, before we get there this evening? I'm looking forward to spending a week out at uh, Whispering Pines Bible Camp and being their camp speaker for the week. And just sort of, we're going to go through the whole, kind of just some of the, the main stories that, that Jesus taught and, and some of the, the key events of his life. And, and obviously, this is one of them, right? Where, you know, the storms are just brewing and, and, and they're, the, the water is starting to fill up over the boat and, and the boat's taking on so much water that these trained fishermen are convinced that they're going to go down and they're going to die. And they go searching for Jesus and they find him sleeping and they're just flabbergasted by that. They're like, don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus kind of rubs the sleep out of his eyes and he, he gets up and he, and he looks out at the wind and the waves and he says, be still. And the second he says, be still, it's as calm as glass. This is, this is an incredible miracle. The disciples then are mouths hanging open and they look at you know, Jesus and they, they, they look at what they've just seen and they go, who is this? Who, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And of course, this story isn't just a story. It's a story that should encourage all of us. Because we've been like those fishermen in our life, right? Sometimes our life that's the boat is taking on some water. And we're like, we're going down. Like, this is not good. And we need to be like the disciples and look for Jesus. And the moment he speaks the word, right? Be still. It's still. And, and so it, it's just a matter of time. And, and, you know, sometimes he lets us go through the storm for a little while. And, and he has a good purpose for that too. But we know that our God, when he says, be still, it's still. Well, this morning, we're not going to look at that story. I just wanted to give you a little taster there because I thought it was very connected to many of the worship songs that we just sang. But um, this morning, we're back to Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles, I'm just going to invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. I'm just going to look at um, verse 24 to verse 28 today. So I'm going to be reading from the NIV version, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. There we read, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Let us pray, shall we? Father God, thank you so much that you are the God who can calm the storms in our life. We also thank you, Lord, for the way that this passage highlights all that you've done for us. We were in a problem where we were way in over our heads, the problem of sin, and we have no answer to that problem. But we thank you that you do, and we thank you that you stood as our representative and you took our place as our substitute. And we thank you that we can take some time to just reflect on that again this morning as we look at this passage. I pray that you would just speak through me, and I pray that you would just um, stir in the hearts of your people who have come this morning. May we take up the challenge that you gave many times over. Let he who has ears hear. So Lord, help us to do that even now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week was, uh, of course, Beef and Barley Days, and uh, one of the things that just sort of kind of came up was we, and Randy, I'm, I'm kind of picking on you like every week it seems like now, but that's okay. You take it well, right? So I'm not picking on you actually today, but I'm going to tell a little story about us. On the, on the, uh, the, the float, right, or, or the wagon as we call it. So we piled the kids on there and got a bunch of these guys were on there and, and um, it, was, it was pretty nice. Lori was there and I, I, they said, Don, you ought to just, just sit on up in the front. And I thought, okay, so I'm going to sit up in the front with Randy and Randy's got the horses and 
We've never done a float before with horses, and, and Randy was thinking for more than a month about, I hope this is going to be okay. I'm just a little concerned about when that train goes through and it blows its whistle, like how the horses are going to react to all of that, right? So I'm like, okay, it's, it's all right. And I'm not that familiar with horses, right? So I, I don't know, like, is this dangerous or not? I've seen horses in a parade before. I don't know all that goes into it. It looks like it's fairly safe. But I also get this mental idea of, like, what would happen if, like, these horses just take off and they just, like, take the, <laughs> the wagon running through the crowd of people in the parade? Like, this would be, like, the end of the rock. I mean, only Jesus would be able to calm that storm, right? Um, so anyway, we're, we're riding along, and, and we barely get going. And I'm sitting in the front, and, uh, and, and we barely get going, and immediately the guys with the drums and the dragon thing and everything else get right in behind us, and they just start, and, and the horses start prancing up, and, and you can just see Randy's heart rate just get a little bit higher, and he's getting control over these horses, but he's like, whoa, whoa, boys, whoa, whoa, you know, and, and I'm sitting there going, oh, <laughs> this, this is not what I'm familiar with. Like, Randy knows how contro much control he has over this situation. I don't. So I'm a little bit like, mm, okay, I'm trying to be calm, but I'm, I'm reading... Uh, it made my heart feel a lot better when Randy started to actually talk to some of the people in the parade. Hey, how are you doing and stuff? I was like, okay, good. I think, I think everything's going to be okay. Now, the reason I tell that story is because I want us to imagine being me, who has no experience really with horses, sitting at the front of the wagon in that kind of a situation. And it wasn't just the, the, the dragons and the drums. Of course, the train did go by, and then even some little kid ran out to get some candy almost right in front of the horses. It was a little wild. Like, I have to be honest with you, when that ride was over, I was kind of like, okay, good. I'm, I'm glad we're done with that. But I want you to, I want you to think for a second what it would have been like if, if, if there was no Randy, it, it, like, like steering the horses. It was, it was me with no experience. And, and now, now let me make this story a little bit worse. Like, let's imagine that, that I don't even know where this parade is going. Like, I don't know how long it's going to go for. I don't know exactly what we're going to face. And and, and I'm just doing my best to just try to pretend like I know what I'm doing, but really I have no idea. I have no idea where this parade is going, and we got me in control over something I have no business being in control over, right? And you think, well, very few people would think that was a good idea. You probably shouldn't do that. And yet when you think about life and how people go through life, don't they kind of go through life a little bit like a wagon ride without Randy, where they don't, they don't, they don't know about these horses. They, they, they've never, they've never steered horses before. They don't know how to respond to their, their emotional reactions to drum beats and train horns and kids running out in front of them and all these kinds of things. They don't know how to handle the situation. And worse, they don't even know where the parade is going. Think about that. That's kind of how people go through life. Hey, I'm in control. I'm, I'm in charge. I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'm in the front steering the ship here. And I don't even know where this life is taking me, but it's going to take me somewhere, I hope. I don't know exactly where. But I guess we just get so common, we're so familiar with that being the norm, that people just get used to that as the way it is. And we would never do that. We would think that is a crazy idea to get on a wagon when you don't know anything about horses and, and steer the ship through a parade of people and all the other different crazy things going on in that type of a scenario. And yet that's how people go through life. And to make it even a little bit worse, there's also this sense, I think, inside of each one of us, because it's true, that one day we are going to be judged by the all-knowing. We're going to be judged as to how well we actually steered the wagon through the parade. And you know what? We're not looking for you to do okay and not to have a complete disaster, but we're looking for you to do this and do it like a, a trained, experienced, you know, someone who knows what they're doing and does it not just well, but perfectly. I mean, life looks a little hopeless at this point. And yet that's how a lot of people go through life. And I guess they just put it out of their mind where we're headed and that we don't even know where we're headed. And, and, and who's in control? It's somebody that doesn't really know what they're doing in, in control of my life, me, right? And then we come to this passage here in Hebrews chapter 9. And I think when we come to this passage here in Hebrews chapter 9, we are filled with some encouragement. Because there is somebody who wants to take the reins in your life. You can do it all by yourself. You can, you can push the experienced person that knows what they're doing off to the side and tell them to stay on their own. You got this. You're going to look after it. 
You're not even going to get information as to how far this parade goes or what all the obstacles are that you're going to face along the way. You're going to take it on yourself. This is what a lot of people do. They say, I don't need anybody to tell me how to live my life. I do it just fine on my own. Right? Well, we have this opportunity to give somebody the reins in our life. And that person is Jesus Christ. That's what we hear here in Hebrews, that he is willing to stand in our place as our representative. Hebrews chapter 9, 24, I just read it, but I'm going to read it again. It says, For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Basically what Jesus is saying when he says, I will stand in your place. I will be your representative. I think of kind of like a, a defense attorney, a, a lawyer who is there to defend your case and to make sure that you are represented very, very well. Like, imagine that you had a serious crime that was thrown at you. And, and you know, like in that type of a situation, you're going to go to court and you're going to be judged to determine whether or not this this conviction that you've been, that's been placed before you is, is, is true or not, and, and whether or not you are going to be convicted, you'd want to have the best. You'd want to have the best representative. Surely you wouldn't go into a situation like that and say, I'll look after myself. I'll stand in there for myself. I, I'll just figure it out as I go along. You'd want to have a great person to be your representative, right? And this is what Jesus is willing to do. And not only that, but we're not going into a courtroom that has got this judge who's sketchy and he kind of, you know, bends the rules to favor what he wants or in his own situation. He treats some people fairly and some people not so fairly like, unfortunately, some judges do. But we have this judge that's perfect who, like, always treats everybody fairly and justly. Okay, so, so it's looking good if we're willing to let Jesus be our representative, our defense attorney, and we're going to go before the Father who's the judge, and he's going to determine for us whether we have been given a fair and just trial. But there's one problem. There's one big problem. The problem is, is we're guilty. We're guilty. So if you get a judge who's going to give you a fair and just trial, and you get a defense attorney who's going to represent you as best as, as it is possible, and he's going to represent you and, 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 you know, he's going to represent who you truly are. But the problem is, you're guilty. Right? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I'm guilty. You're guilty. All, it says, are guilty. Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. You know, I just wonder, in, even in this room, but I wonder how many times we would hear if you went up to somebody and you said, you know, what do you think is going to happen to you after you die? And the person would say, well, I think there might be life after death. And, and they, they say, well, you know, do you think that you'll go to heaven when you die? And they say, well... What, do you, what kind of an answer would we expect? You'd probably say, well, I, I hope so. And you'd say, well, why? Why do you, why do you think? And they'd, they'd go on with usually answers like, well, I, I think I've been a pretty good person. I, I try really hard to, to do the best that I can. I, I, I hope that I'm going to be good enough. Right? That's what it always seems to come down to for a lot of people. You hope that you're going to be good enough. Well, when you really get looking at the scriptures and you really get looking at the law, you realize that none of us are good enough. Not one of us. So we got this representative who's our defense attorney. We got the fair and just judge, but we're guilty. Well, what do you do in that situation? Well, people get defensive. People make excuses. People compare themselves to others, but none of these strategies are going to work. So what do you do in that situation? Well, what you should do is you should throw yourself upon the mercy of the Father. That's what you should do. You should be that person standing in that courtroom, throwing themselves upon the mercy of the judge. You know, there's a very famous parable about this in... Um, that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 18. 
And if we want to just flip over there quickly, this is, of course, the story of the, uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 and following. It says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector looked at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we have this very common story about one who is making the excuses, trying to convince everybody that they're good enough, comparing themselves to others, trying all those roots. We got the other guy who just throws himself upon the mercy of the Father. And it says he went away forgiven. No, it says he went away justified. That's interesting, justified. Do you know what that's all about? Did you know justification is a legal term? You see, when somebody is again in a court case, and um, they're being tried for some accusation that's been leveled at them, and they go through the whole case, and after careful review, they determine that this person did not commit the crime that they were um, challenged, that, 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 it was, that it was leveled at them. They, they, were not, they were not guilty. They didn't commit that crime. They're innocent. Then in the courtroom, the judge would say, I declare this person justified. It means they never did it. Okay? That's different than forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is when you did do it. You, 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 you did whatever it is that you did. You did it. You're guilty. So now that's different because that's forgiveness, forgiving somebody for something that they've done to you or to God, right? So in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, it says that the tax collector went away not forgiven, and this guy wasn't a great guy. I mean, he literally didn't want to look up to, you know, like normally back in those days, they would go up to the temple and they would look up and they would maybe hold their hands up and they would pray out to God, almost kind of in a, in a way that at, at times would maybe even look a little proud, you know, like, look at me, I'm praying at the temple and I'm looking up to the heavens and I'm so proud of who I am and look at all my grandiose prayers that I'm making here at the temple. Like, this guy goes up to the temple and he just hangs his head in shame and he can't even look up and he just looks down and he just beats his breast and he says, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? How can this guy, this guy had a reason to be in that disposition. You know, he was guilty. He did do some terrible things. Tax collectors were notorious for being cheaters and, and people who would turn on their own people and people who would scounge money out of their own, like find ways to rip off their own countrymen and so on and so forth. They were detested by their whole community. He had good reason to be hanging his head. But he goes away justified? How is that possible? Think about the judge again. I said the judge is just and fair. Is it just and fair to declare somebody who has done terrible things as not just forgiven, but justified? How is that possible? That is the question. Like, like how can God do that? If God does that and he's supposedly this fair and just judge, well, I'm sorry, but he's not. Because a fair and just judge would declare somebody guilty, guilty. You can't declare them justified. That's not right. It's like when you're watching, a, I don't know, a sports game, whether it be football or hockey or basketball, or whatever it is that you like, and you can clearly tell that the other team is cheating. They're like fouling the other team. They're um, doing some, well, didn't we just hear about this already you know, with our Olympic team, right? Our women's Olympic team, sadly, scoping out the practices of the other teams, and they're getting some stiff penalties, you know, put in their way, apparently, because they cheated. And does anybody go, 
well, you know, we should just let them off. I mean, okay, they, they broke the rules, and they cheated, and it's okay. I mean, we, don't, we all, you know, no, you can't do that because that's not fair, and that's not just. And if that's what God does, well, then he's not fair, and he's not just. So how can he call a, a guilty sinner somebody who's not just forgiven but justified? Well, guess what? Jesus didn't just come to be our perfect representative, but he came to be our substitute. Our substitute. So if we keep reading, in verse 25 and 26, again, it says, Nor did he, referring to Jesus, enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. From the very beginning of the creation. Do you remember what happened at the creation? You know, when God created the heavens and the earth and he, he made the first man and he made the first woman, and he made them sinless, right? They never sinned before. They hadn't really been tested, but they never sinned before. So there's Adam and there's Eve. And he gives them this beautiful place to live and all these options and all these trees that they can eat from. And then he says, just don't eat from this one tree. And of course, they do it. They eat from the one tree. We know the story. So they're guilty. They ate. They disobeyed. They disobeyed the one thing that God told them not to do. They did it. And at first, they feel shame and they feel embarrassed. And they, 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 they realize for the first time they're naked and they try to cover it up. They put the fig leaves on and everything else. And that's kind of like man's approach to this problem of sin. Is that, you know what, we're going to make excuses, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna compare ourselves to other people, we're going to find all the reasons for how we're going to get around this sin problem. That's the fig leaves. But then God, in his love, he provides them with a proper covering. Like with this animal skin that will protect them, because now all of a sudden the elements that they're going to be sent out of into is going to be hard, and fig leaves aren't going to do the job. But what had to happen in order for there to be animal skins? Those animals had to die. They had to serve as the substitute for their sin. And right from the very beginning, God is teaching us as his people about this concept of a substitute. And then there's, we've been looking at this through Hebrews, you know, 7, 8, and now into 9 about how there were always these animal sacrifices and these animals would be the substitute. But these animals were, were not a perfect substitute. They were less than perfect. They didn't finish the job. They, they, they weren't adequate. So that's why they had to keep being sacrificed again and again and again and again. Because they weren't perfect. They weren't, they weren't adequate. They weren't what was really needed to serve as a substitute. An animal is an animal and we aren't animals. So we need someone else to be our substitute. We need a person. We need a man. We need somebody who could actually live this life without sin, to serve as our substitute. And that's what Jesus did. And when he offered this sacrifice, he offered it once for all. Once for all. Now, I got to say something about the Catholic Church at this point. Because, you know, one of the things that, that the Catholic Church teaches is they teach about the Eucharist. And they teach about how when we do, we call it the Lord's table, or we might call it communion. But they teach about how the, the, the bread literally becomes the body of the Lord. And they teach how the cup literally does become the blood of the Lord. And they teach basically that, they teach basically that, that every time they perform the Eucharist, they call it that, that, that the sacrifice is being made again and again and again and again. Now, let me, let me say something about Catholic Church. I do believe there are good people in the Catholic Church. I believe that there are people who are godly and, and, and have a personal relationship with the Lord in the Catholic Church. But what I, So I'm not trying to not say that. What I am saying is, is that there are things that the Catholic Church teaches that are clearly not consistent with what Scripture teaches. And this is one of them. This is one of the big ones. Because they're teaching the complete opposite of what we're hearing here in Hebrews. And through doing that, they're implying that Jesus' sacrifice once for all wasn't enough. 
That it was like the animal sacrifices that were imperfect and weren't adequate, and so they need to be offered again and again and again and again. No. Jesus offered himself once for all. It's the, it's the perfect, the most adequate, complete substitute, the perfect substitute that all of those other foreshadowings of all those other sacrifices were pointing towards. And so now the judge can look at us and he doesn't see our guilt because that was taken on the substitute, Jesus. Now when he looks at us, the righteousness of Jesus was placed on us. So now the fact that the judge is perfectly righteous and perfectly just is a really good thing. Because a perfect, just judge would never make a sin, or all sin, be paid for twice. Right? That's not fair. That's not just. I mean, this is sin. It needs to be paid for, but it only needs to be paid for once. As long as there's an adequate substitute to pay this penalty. And that's what Jesus did for us. Now, how, how confident can we be in all of this? Well, this is what the Hebrew author goes into now. In verse 29. Um, sorry, verse 27. He says, just as people, or just as man, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. You probably heard the saying before. There's two things. There's only two guarantees in life, right? Death and taxes, right? Well, basically that's what the Hebrew author is using here. He's saying, how sure can we be that we're going to die one day. Well, look at the statistics. One out of one people die. So the chances that you are going to die someday are really, really high. The only way that it's not going to happen is if Jesus returns first and raptures the church. And that could happen. It's a matter of time. It will happen. It might happen in our lifetime. It might not. But if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, it's guaranteed... And that's what it says here, that we are going to die. We don't like to think about that too much either. This is part of the whole getting on the wagon and going for a ride with the horses, and we just, don't, we just like to fake it till we make it. We don't want to really talk about the facts. But the facts are is that we're going to die. And most people, even the most ardent you know, atheist or whatever, will say, yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. We're all going to die. But here's the thing, it says that we're not just going to die, but we are appointed, or as the NIV here says, destined to die. I find that very interesting. I find that very comforting, that we're appointed to die. Essentially, what we know from that is that God has set an appointment with us. Like, he knows exactly when we're going to die. He's got an appointment. We don't know when this appointment is. We don't know when, we don't know, but, but he knows and he guarantees that that appointment will be kept. There's only uh, one reason I believe that um, Donald Trump is, is still alive, right? Like a guy shoots a, I think it was a few shots at him, but the one caught his ear, right? And, and he's still, you know, how, how do you get that close and not die? Well, it, just a lucky shot? No, I don't believe it was a lucky shot. I believe that it wasn't his time. God has set an appointed time when he will die. God has set an appointed time when I will die. God has set an appointed time when you will die. And he's going to keep that appointment. And this is why in our lives we have stories. I have stories, you have stories of these times when we did something crazy and I, we should have died and we didn't. It wasn't your time. God set an appointed time. This is, this is you know, such a comforting, actually, thing in a lot of ways. Because when people don't realize this, they get really nervous. They all of a sudden think, I am running the wagon here. I'm in control over the horses. I've got to make sure I'm taking the right medication. I've got to make sure I'm taking the, the right, I've got to be eating the right foods. I, I've got to be getting exactly the right amount of exercise. I've got to be being very, very careful that I never like do anything that could be considered risky. Because if I don't, I'm going to die. But it's actually quite... Um, there's a lot of peace that comes with knowing that we have an appointed time. And God's going to keep that appointment. You know, in, in Psalm 139, verse 16, we read this. It says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. 
All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. All the days, all my days, all your days ordained for me were written in your book. There's a book that has every one of our days, exactly how many days we're going to live for, written. It also says in this verse, it says that just as we were appointed to die, we were appointed to die once. That's important too, because a lot of people claim to believe in something like reincarnation, where, well, you know, if you didn't get it right the first time, you're going to die, and then you're going to come back to life and get another shot at it. You're going to get another crack at this. You're, you didn't get it right, so we'll just keep working on this, and we'll try again, and we'll try again, and who knows how many times we're going to live this life, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have more opportunity. No, you're not. You're going to have one opportunity. And this is the one opportunity that we all have. And when it's over, it's over. You get one crack at this. It says we're not destined to die many times. It says we're destined to die once. This is why the psalmist also wrote, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12. And then it says, And after that to face judgment. So all these things are guarantees. We're going to die. We're appointed to die. We're going to die once, and after that, there's going to be judgment. Now, what judgment is this referring to? Um, you know, there's two main judgments in the Bible. And the one this is talking about is not the judgment about, you know, where, where we're going to be judged for how we lived as believers. This is talking about the judgment that all people are going to face after they die. This is talking about the judgment that's referred to in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27. If you just want to skip over to the next chapter, it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. That's that judgment. Oof. I mentioned last week, the bad news in the Bible, the Bible doesn't shy away from it. It just tells it like it is again and again and again. And the reason it does that is not because it wants to scare us. It's not because it wants to manipulate us. It's because it's true. And if something like judgment is true, well, you don't want to shy away from it. You want to say it like it is. I mean, I'm pretty sure when those people's houses were about to burn down in Jasper, they didn't say, well, you know, um, they're not going to like it very much if we tell them their houses are going to burn down. So let's just not tell them. Like, you know, the fire is coming, but it's going to be very inconvenient for them to hear that. And, um, you know, uh, it's just going to inconvenience them. I'm sure they've got lots of plans in their life right now going on. They get, it's going to mess up their whole day. I mean, they're going to have to pack up as quickly as they can and drive out of here. I'm pretty sure they told them. And if they didn't tell them, what would we have thought? The, the, the fire would have just come and it would have not just burned up buildings, it would have burned up people. And then they would have been like, why didn't somebody tell? So this is why the Bible continually reminds us again and again about what happens after we die. It's because it doesn't want us to be unaware. It, God loves us too much. He's the one that wrote this. He loves us too much to leave us just sitting comfortably in our ignorance. And the judgment comes. So all those things are guaranteed and we can be as, co as confident as we are in those things. We can be confident that Jesus is the perfect representative and that he is the perfect substitute. And that's where he takes us back to now in the last verse I'm going to look at today is verse 28. So Christ was sacrificed once. Just as you'll die once, Christ was sacrificed once. To take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's pretty cool. The first time he came, he came to bear sin. He came to be our substitute. He came to take our sin upon himself. That was the first time he came. The second time he comes, he's not coming to bear sin this time. The next time he comes, why is he coming? He's coming to bring salvation. A lot of times we hear the word salvation and we think of it only in one term, one, one concept, which is the salvation that we receive when we first believe. When you first put your faith in Jesus, you receive salvation, your sins are forgiven. And this is how we normally think of salvation. 
But salvation in the Bible is used in three different ways, actually. It's used that way, but it's also used to describe what happens after we believe, because after we believe, God gives us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes and he brings about salvation through us, which is basically the whole concept of how he changes us from the inside out to be the kind of people that he wants us to be. But then there's even a third way. There's the salvation that we will receive when Jesus returns, when we will finally be saved out of this world. That still we're dealing with the flesh, we're dealing with um, the enemy, we're dealing with the whole world system that we look at, and we, we, we watch the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, and we're like, what on earth is that? That's the world. That's what Jesus is going to save us out of. Praise the Lord, right? So the next time he comes, he's going to bring salvation, that kind of salvation, saving us out of this system that we're locked into, this, the flesh, our own flesh that we struggle with, uh, um, the enemy who wants to constantly steal, kill, and destroy. He's going to save us from all that once and for all. We have that in the future. That's coming in the future. But he's going to bring salvation to whom? Who's going to receive this salvation? Those who are waiting for him. Those who are waiting for him. You know, we should really have a sense of, with, with, with God, we should have a sense of, I am looking forward to, day, to Jesus' return. Because I know... He's not only my, Jesus is not only my perfect representative, but he's my perfect substitute. He's taken my sin. So when he comes, I'm going to be received. And I don't have to say, I hope so. I can say, I know so, because I don't stand in what I've hopefully done enough of. I, ho I stand in what he did. And he said, it's finished. I'm confident in that. I look forward to him coming. Because when he comes, he's going to save me out of all this. I, it's going to be incredible. We should have the kind of anticipation in Jesus' second coming that, we, that's, that just makes all other things that we anticipate in life pale in comparison. You know, like we anticipate things like, um, you know, um, marriage, and we anticipate our, the birth of our first child, and those are good things to anticipate. But they should pale in comparison to how we should anticipate the return of the Lord. They should pale in comparison. And... Jesus, when he returns, um, again, he's going to save us out of all this stuff that we have to deal with every day, and, and, we, and we look forward to that. We look forward to that. And we can be confident in that. We can be as confident in that as we are in what verse 27 said, that we're, we're destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So I hope that you will be part of those that are anticipating his return. Because there's those that I don't think anticipate his return. And the ones that don't anticipate his return are obviously the ones who are kind of like on this, I hope I've done enough. I think I've been a good person. Um, you know, I'm better than so-and-so down the road. That guy's not anticipating the Lord's return. Because when he comes, he's coming, and then there will be judgment. Doesn't sound very hopeful. I'd prefer that he just stays away. So, where do you fit? Where do you fit today? Are you anticipating his return? Or are you someone who, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty I have in my life. There's a lot of things in my life that I'm kind of hiding. I know that when he comes, he's going to be coming like a bright light and he's going to expose all the darkness. And I don't really like that idea. Because I got some stuff hidden. And I want to keep it hidden. Or are you somebody who, no, I have been like the, the Pharisee. I have, I have thrown myself upon the mercy of the judge and I have received the incredible, um, um, the incredible reciprocal effects of what the substitute did for all of us. Where are you today? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for the way that it does not shy away from the hard truths of Scripture. We don't ever want to be guilty of um, negligence because we thought we just didn't want to upset people by telling them the bad news. When they hear the bad news, though, Lord, I pray that they would look to 
what God, who loves each and every one of us, has offered. The perfect representative and the perfect substitute. Lord, one day we're all going to die. And you have an appointment with each one of us. And you know exactly when that day is going to come. I pray that we be ready. And I pray that we be ready for when you come again. Not to bear sin this time, but to bring about the salvation that we all long for. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.